Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Waynesburg Effect. I'm Ryan Schwertfaker here alongside our panelists, Emily Bennett and Andy Sanko. Welcome back to you both. Good to see you. You too. Uh, if you haven't watched the show before, each panelist will bring up a current event topic that has an effect on the nation, the community, or us as college students. Each panelist will get an opportunity to give their opinion on the issue at hand, and we may even engage in a friendly debate on the topic. Now, all of us have our own opinions, but we make sure that what we say is backed up with facts so that you, the viewer, can not only be more informed, but also capable to form your own opinions on how the topic we discuss affects you, affects your family, and affects your friends. But this is The Waynesburg Effect. Welcome back to The Waynesburg Effect. Now, I hope that you were watching, but on election night, we had a live election night coverage right here from the fourth floor of Buell Hall on WCTV. And I was with these wonderful co-panelists, Emily Bennett and Andy Stanko, for the entire broadcast. Uh, and it was great to have you guys. So, but I want to just, I know you probably are sick and tired of hearing about the election, but we're now in a transition period. Donald Trump has been elected our 45th president. And we kind of had that inkling kind of going into the night when we finished the show. I mean, they, we were still waiting on Pennsylvania, and they didn't, they didn't call Michigan until very, very recently either. But I was just really curious, before kind of getting into the election and what it means, I did want to hear from the two of you a little bit more about how you thought the show went, what you thought the highlights were. Uh, eventually, we are going to be posting that video online, so if you missed it and would like to re-see or watch for the first time the election coverage, you should have that available for you. So I'll start with Emily, if you want to talk a little bit about how you thought the show went, some of the interesting uh, aspects of the show. and I mean, it was a long night. It was like three hours and 30 minutes, I think, we were on the yep. air. 3040, I think we wrapped up around 1140 ish. Yeah, that sounds about right. 1140. Sure. I think so. It's kind of a, a little bit of a blur, but I thought it went really well. We had great people behind the scenes. I do want to shout out to them feeding us information so that we could be so up to date on our information. And I, I just thought it went really smoothly. There's a lot of things that could have gone wrong that didn't go wrong. Um, and just the technology we have these days just really helped us be able to do what we do. and. Pull it off. I'll say kudos to you, Ryan, because every little aspect of that show was scripted out, and we just hit all the points, and all of a sudden it's 11 o'clock. We've got results <laughs> flying in from our guys uh, in our little chat system, and we're going and going and going. I, I think it was a, a phenomenal job of planning, first and foremost. And then having the local angle, I was really proud to have on Dr. Waddell, Dr. Stratton, student leaders, Pam Snyder after she won her seat. It was a fun night, but there's so much that stems from that night. It's not the end, more so the beginning for this next four years. Yes, and uh, like I said, you know, we didn't get to call it uh, at, while we were on the air as, as much as I kind of hoped that would be something fun that we could do. Uh, but it did wind up Donald Trump is our next president. Uh, he got 306 electoral votes. Hillary Clinton, 232 electoral votes. However, the big story is, yes, Donald Trump won the Electoral College, but now we're having that controversy in terms of, well, did most of America want Donald Trump is our next president. So I did a quick look in terms of the popular vote. So the popular vote, Hillary Clinton currently stands at 64,665,486 votes to Donald Trump's 62,425,963. Now, some other interesting statistics I want to pull up before uh, bringing this uh, topic up to you guys. Excuse me, up to you guys. It looked up in the swing states, which is you know, where the election is decided, who won vote-wise in the swing states. Donald Trump won 22,175,355 votes in the swing states to Hillary Clinton's 21,345,601. So it was still close either way, but most of the votes that Hillary Clinton got that are pushing her ahead of the popular vote by 2 million votes came from states that weren't swing states. Blue states. From blue states, mainly. Uh, so I'd like to, I guess I'll start off with Andy on this one. Um, what would you say to the people, you know, people in the, in the Clinton camp who are still maybe very surprised as to how the night went? And, you know, they want to say, well, yes, the Electoral College might have spoken and they went to Donald Trump, but the people felt another way. Well, to those in the Clinton camp, I'd like to remind them that 
when it comes to the Electoral College, we have something called the Constitution, and that's how we select our president. And before the election, if you don't accept the results of the election, you're undermining democracy, and now the, the foot is on, or the tables have turned. The shoe is on the other foot for Clinton. And, and I really want to get to the nitty gritties of, of Donald Trump and what the first 100 days would look like. That's where I'd really want or to so steer. So we're told the first 100 days are going What I want to steer this towards because when we had our conversation with Kevin McCullough on the, the show of the night of the election, what does a Donald Trump presidency look like? And he's a conservative commentator. He was really excited that he would have someone with conservative values, someone who would check all these boxes and do these things. But you've got the predictable withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, canceling environmental regulations, those things that you expected from him. It's the unexpected, it's the volatility that you get with Donald Trump. What happens when you're in a crisis? What happens when some of the people that he's, some of his constituents, because we're now all his constituents, go against him? How will he respond as the president? Because he is in, in, in an office now where he is the president of all the people, and it doesn't make sense to come back negatively and attack those who he's there to, to, to support and represent. So. Yeah, and I'd like to just uh, turn to Emily quick, and I, I'll, I'll well, ask my original question, then also kind of go off of what Andy just said. You know, if you're one of the Donald Trump supporters, you think, well, yes, we won, but you know, use the other argument on the other side. Well, yes, you won the electoral college, but you lost the popular vote. You know, if you're Donald Trump, does that mean you govern as, you know, what some people think he'll govern as a really extreme conservative? Or, you know, maybe the other side of Donald Trump and he'd be more of a pragmatist, moderate, populist type guy. So I'm, I'm curious to hear, like, how, you know, what kind of tying in both sides, do the election results maybe have an effect on what type of President Trump that we wind up seeing in this first term? I don't think that um, has too much of a, how he's going to be. Um, I don't think that's going to have too much of an effect. We'll see, as he, um, Snake was said a little bit, there's such a, you don't know what's going to come out of his mouth. You don't know what he's going to do. That's something that we'll see, how the people around him react. Um, but I don't think the effects, like who won the electoral, the electoral votes and the popular vote, I don't think that's going to have an outcome on how he's going to be as president. And it's not like it's a huge um, difference between the popular vote. I know electoral he won by a lot, but I know the popular vote was close, and there's still recounts going on, and I know in Wisconsin they're doing more recounts, and I just think that's going to continue because those Hillary supporters don't want to back down. And I think long term, this whole recount popular vote, it's just a footnote on what these four years are going to be for Donald Trump. He will be made or broken based on the four years, not based on the fact that, oh, he won the Electoral College. It's a fun trivia thing to have, but... As far as the, the big issues and the angles you can take, you've got some storylines here with Donald Trump. You've got Supreme Court justices, Justice Ginsburg, 83, Justice Kennedy, 80, St uh, Justice Breyer, 78. And the seat vacated by Justice Scalia. And Justice Scalia. Scalia, of course, passed away this past February. All of a sudden, you're looking at Donald Trump and, and potentially putting people into the Supreme Court, especially with some big precedents that you can set with the highest law, uh, court of the land. I think that is an even more pressing and an important issue that you could get to with him winning the presidency. Yeah, so I guess we're going to have to see what winds up happening in the election. and Or, sorry, we know the election, but I guess once we have the inauguration and just kind of the days leading up as he's naming all these different cabinet posts, and we'll have to see where that goes. But uh, off of that, we're going to go to Andy Stanko. We're after the break for our next segment to talk about how maybe some of the news stories that you wind up saw, uh, seeing affected the outcome of the election. We'll be right back. Sweet pizza. What the? Hey, how about you try this banana? Gee, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot better. If you be good to your body, it will be good to you. Make smart choices when selecting what you will eat. Visit ChooseMyPlate.gov for more information on the best foods to bring out the best you. With the result of the presidential election, many are asking, 
why or how did this happen? And many are pointing towards a number of, of different things. However, one thing that's popped up in the past couple of weeks has been the results or the impact of fake news on the general election, and now it seems to be an even more pressing issue. The fake news that I'm talking about is what you see on your Facebook feed, what you see in advertisements, things like, you won't believe, the Pope endorsed Donald Trump. <laughs> that, so on and so forth, has had, according to some, a very large impact on this presidential election. Now, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook said after the election, he posted that he believed that fake news was not an issue in the election. He said that more than 99% of what people see on Facebook is authentic. That makes it extremely unlikely hoaxes change the outcome of the election in one direction or the other. However, a BuzzFeed news analysis found that during the final three weeks, or final three months, pardon me, leading up to the presidential campaign, election day, the top 20 fake news stories had more impressions, more likes, shares, and comments than the top 20 real news stories following the election in that same time period. Stuff like, the Pope endorses Donald Trump. So now I'll turn to you guys. Mark Zuckerberg says that fake news is a non-issue and did not have an effect on the outcome of this election. What do you think? Emily Bennett. Now, of course, Mark Zuckerberg owns Facebook. Of course he's going to say that. He's got an angle. There's, there's no way he's not going to say, oh my goodness, yes, my, my site obviously um, swayed people's opinions. <laughs> I just, so many of the fake news, I know it's so popular, I see it on Facebook all the time, it frustrates me beyond no end, but come on guys, you can look at those sites and you can see that it's fake a lot of the times. Look at the website name, a lot of them are like, they're off like main websites, but they have like a .co at the very end of it. Like, be educated, as long as you are somewhat educated and look, Look at the page itself. I know I saw some workbooks, like a handout sheet that was like top 10 ways you can find out if a website is actually official or not. So many of them, and this happens all the time, all the time. Celebrity news, and there's so much fake stuff reported and people just run with it. And it's not like they just want to create all that. And do I think it has a sway? Maybe a little bit because so many people believed and some of the stuff Trump has done is kind of unbelievable. So it's easy to make up things about him that people start believing are true and it's not. I'm a little torn with this either way. Some people, some of the people in this world these days can go off and run with it. But then there's the other people that obviously are going to see it's fake. So I don't know. I'm kind of like torn with this one. It is a real thing though, it however. Is. It's out there. Ryan, fake news. What do you think? I think the truth kind of lies in the middle of this one. I think maybe, I don't know what Mark Zuckerberg is using as his definition of <laughs> fake news. I mean, because I think there are some websites that maybe he kind of views as fake news in terms of uh, it's not a, like a phishing website. And maybe that's what he's considering to be fake news. Whereas the definition I think most people are using is stories that aren't true, but they could be content written by actual people. So then it's real. Mm -hmm. I don't know what his definition is on that. So I might, we can fly to California, we can ask him uh, in his t-shirt and uh, pants uh, attire. But I think this, to say that, that fake news swayed the entire election, I, I don't think is right. I think a lot of times people just will give in to the bias that they have and just say, oh, well, like, oh, you know, they'll see the headlines like, oh, Hillary Clinton uh, is going to be arrested tomorrow. And they'll just see that, not even click it. I don't think a bunch of people might even like click it. See the headline and be like, oh yeah, Hillary's going to prison. And they hit share, and then everyone else sees it, and then they share and they share. And I, I, mean, I don't know if Facebook has these numbers, I'm sure they do, but just to find the difference between people who just share the content and then people who actually clicked and read what the story was. And then you know, on top of that, then there's people who will open and share it, but not even like, kind of what Emily was saying, validate what the source is. Or, hmm, this one site's saying Hillary's getting arrested tomorrow, but the New York Times hasn't said anything, the Fox News hasn't said anything, CNN hasn't said anything. I wonder why. Do they have like some special hidden scoop that I don't know about, or is something a little off here? But I think the media, the general media, is also to blame uh, for the rise of fake news in the sense of you know, just seeing how they covered this election, saying, oh, Donald Trump doesn't have a chance, he's not going to do anything, and then all of a sudden he wins, you know, I think that in a way kind of proves a little bit what Donald Trump's point was. He tried to make is, you know, the media's awful, it's rigged against me. So, but then instead of 
talent instead of the people telling the media, hey, you know, maybe try and get some different points of view so that everyone's more accurately represented, they automatically will just uh, turn elsewhere and it's not reputable news sources. So I think the media also had a role in causing this upon themselves. I read an interview with a professional fake news uh, distributor, Paul Horner, who he spoke with the Washington Post, and he said, people are definitely dumber. They keep passing stuff around. No one facts checks anything anymore. I think Trump is in the White House because of me. His followers don't fact check anything. They'll post everything. And then if Google and Facebook will crack down, which is something they're trying to do now, I would just try different things. I have at least 10 sites right now. If they crack down on a couple, I'll use others. You could shut down advertising on all of my sites. I think I'd be OK. This is a professional where his job is to create fake news and get eyeballs and get shares and then make advertising off of it. So I turn towards traditional media. And Ryan, you made this point. I think fake news and that impact carries over to reputable news outlets. We know they're slanted, or we don't know they're, they've fact-checked. What would you say is the solution? What are you looking for out of reputable media or traditional media to really compete in this, this fake news world that we live in today? Uh, I would just I'll, 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 quickly kind of just go off of what I just said because my response will be nice and short. <laughs> um, I, I think the media needs to do a better job of kind of looking outside of their big bubble, or I'm sorry, outside of their small bubble and get a bigger bubble. Uh, I mean, because pe like, all the people who they were having on as guests, they're from New York, they're from Washington, D.C., they're from California, but no one was there covering the heartland of America to see what the average person thinks about things. And I think if maybe they did that, they would kind of get different points of view uh, to more broadly um, have, a better, you know, have a better newscast and better information and better perspectives on things. And then I think maybe like, something like a Trump victory wouldn't have been as surprising. Finally, we'll get to Black Friday next. How about okay. that, Emily? Sounds good. When we come back, we'll talk, we'll talk about Black Friday and its effect on America. You're watching The Waynesburg Effect. Oh, sweet pizza. What the? Why don't you try this banana? Gee, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot better. If you be good to your body, it will be good to you. Make smart choices when selecting what you will eat. Visit ChooseMyPlate.gov for more information on the best foods to bring out the best you. Welcome back to the Waynesburg Effect. We're going to talk about some Black Friday now. Now, the term Black Friday was coined in the 1960s to mark the kickoff to the Christmas shopping season. Black refers to the stores moving from the red to the black. Back when the accounting records, red ink was indicated as a loss and black as a profit. Now, Black Friday shopping has become bigger and bigger. The sales are promo promoted more and more, and the shopping times have crept into Thursday night. Thanksgiving is overlooked more and more, and people have to leave their family dinners to go prepare for the crazy shoppers. How big will this Black Friday holiday shopping phenomenon become? Now, I know around me, a lot of this shopping started Thursday night at 6 p.m. The stores were opening. What do you guys think of this change becoming more of a Thursday night thing than just a Friday? I think that's sort of late. 5 p.m. was the norm where I was for, for this Thanksgiving. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I didn't go out and take advantage of any of the deals. Peebles was closed since the last <laughs> time I went Black Friday shopping. I'll say this for, for Black Friday. Th this Thanksgiving Day phenomena is relatively new, past five years for it to be a, a widespread thing. And I think that what we're seeing now is Black Friday isn't Black Friday anymore. We're seeing more and more of the stores start to get into their discounts, start to run their specials, start to run their doorbusters earlier and earlier in the month. Why? Because I feel like Black Friday starts when Amazon decides it starts. And, and not necessarily Amazon specifically, but with so much that's going on in terms of being ordered online, on mobile. And when you look at millennials, 40% will, will purchase most of or a significant portion of their holiday shopping from an online retailer like Amazon, compared to the baby boomers who 
Lots will do little to none of that shopping in, in that format. So you're seeing the internet eclipsing three billion in this past year for the first time ever on Black Friday. And I think that's a, that's a real impact. And while you, you still have your chains that are open on Thanksgiving Day, your department stores, Kohl's, JCPenney, Macy's, they will have promotions that drive their sales. That is their formula, Black Friday, they will always be open Black Friday and Thanksgiving Eve as long as it's a cultural norm. But some of the other stores, especially those that don't have online presences, I think they'll also be open on, on Thanksgiving Day to have that hook to get you to come in and take advantage of those retailers. But Well, even now, like it's almost become November has been like a Black Friday month. The deal's been going all through November. I know the whole week of Thanksgiving, I know I was at um, Old Navy and they were doing 50% off like for a couple of days. But Ryan, what do you think of this whole craze and the online <laughs> part of it as well? Well, I think the reason why we're seeing Black Friday go early and earlier is because, you know, especially the brick and mortar stores, they're looking for more and more reasons for people to come into the stores. As Andy said, people are going online now, and I think they're looking for some sort of draw to still bring people in. And plus, I think they're also realizing a little bit, too, that a bunch of people really don't like Thanksgiving. <laughs> they don't like spending time with their family, sitting around at a table, hearing Uncle Joe talk about something uh, for the tenth time. They'd rather go out and do some shopping. Um, but I think what we're also starting to see, and this really started, I think, last year, is that as it was moving early and earlier, I remember, you know, it was 6 a.m., then it was 5 a.m., then it was midnight, and then, you know, now it's like 4 or 5 o'clock, or some places don't close on Thanksgiving. They're just open on Thanksgiving, come in whenever. But now I think we're starting to see a little bit of pushback from that, and now some retailers are saying, hey, you know what, people really should have Thanksgiving with their families. We're going to be closed on Thanksgiving, or we're not going to open until this time on Thanksgiving. So I'm really curious to see, you know, do the stores that close early get a, 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 a more of a benefit in the end because people will respect that and they have a happier employee base or maybe or do those stores suffer because they're not open when other stores are open so I'm not sure if they have any statistics on that yet I'm sure they will in the coming weeks but I'd be really curious to see comparing the retailers that closed on Thanksgiving versus the ones that were either open part of the day or the whole day how did that look you know did one make more than the other and what did what do the employees think about it? are they happy to work on Thanksgiving or do they, uh, do they prefer to be with their families? Now, you touched on this a little bit about the different generations having different more opinions and things. How about you guys and your families? Online shopping, or do you guys go out to that Black Friday craziness? Well, since time? Peebles was closed, I did not go out uh, <laughs> once again, as I've already mentioned. But no, my, my mother and one of my brothers, I think, did go out. Uh, on Black Friday, and they will also utilize uh, online as well. But uh, I think a lot of it, as, as Ryan was, was pointing to, is, is context and what are the stores, what are the employees, what is the area, what are the cultural norms. And, and I think Black Friday is so fascinating because it is so uniquely American because <laughs> it is solely a result of where the two holidays are placed and just the fact that Thanksgiving is the fourth Thursday in November. And then you have just about a month before Christmas. And... You see this whole weekend, and I do want to shout out Small Business Saturday, this whole weekend being blended together and then brought even earlier in the month because of the impact that, that the Internet and online retailers have had. I, it, it's, it's still relatively early in this whole Thanksgiving day of being open cycle. And so I think the data isn't necessarily there, but early returns, mobile shopping, online retailers certainly won Black Friday again this year. I would just have to say, I mean, certain people uh, definitely will go out Black Friday. Either someone on my stepmom's side of the family who definitely goes out no matter what the weather is, for whatever reason, she's out. But I think most of my immediate family will do the online shopping or they'll do the shopping before, except for certain members who procrastinate and they'll, they'll go out when they can. But I, I, for myself, I prefer just to try and go to the mall before Thanksgiving or do online shopping afterwards. And let, let me add to this before we go. I have one, one branch of my family who... It's a tradition on Thanksgiving to just cut coupons <laughs> after Thanksgiving lunch pretty much the whole day and then go out the Black Friday. It's, it's a family thing. It's the culture in which they live, and, and it's how we go about things. And so to each its own, but it's uniquely American. It is very American. A lot of people, it's their traditions. And, you know, when you have that tradition, you just want to stick to it. And that will wrap up our Black Friday discussion. But coming up next, we'll have our last fun segment. You're watching The Waynesburg Effect. Sweet pizza. What the? Hey, how'd you 
try this banana. Gee, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot better. If you be good to your body, it will be good to you. Make smart choices when selecting what you will eat. Visit ChooseMyPlate.gov for more information on the best foods to bring out the best you. Welcome back to the Waynesburg Effect. Time for our fun segment right at the end here. And uh, just two, just two topics today. So we're going to start off with, with Andy. What do you have as your... You, you, you preface this as being a slight rant. Yes, yes. So let's hear it. For, for getting up on the soapbox for this one. Ryan, thank you for giving me the chance to bring up this very important topic that's been slowly burning on the mind for the last three plus months. And as I'm sure you are all aware, there's a new incarnation of Harry Potter lore coming to a big screen near you. Yes, I know Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them does not feature the wizards and witches that we've come to know and love. However, I can rest easy knowing that Harry, Ron, and Hermione cannot be ruined from the escapades of Newt's commander in America in the Roaring Twenties. I look forward to the fresh look at magic in America in a universe that I'm eager to see expanded. I unfortunately cannot say the same for the J.K. Rowling approved play, The Cursed Child, that came out at the end of July. The Cursed Child brings back all the characters that we knew and loved from the seven book modern epic and took everything we knew and ripped it to shreds. To the authors of Cursed Child, nobody who lived through the reign of terror of you-know-who would dare use you-know-who's name in casual conversation, even years after his demise. He would never harbor a child because he was incapable of love, and Ron is more than just comedic relief. And time turners don't work that way. They were destroyed in the Department of Mysteries years before. I hope we can all learn from Harry Potter, and a quick influx of cash, as I call it. If you cannot bring back the same magic, the same tone, the same essence, you should just leave it alone. Follow Star Wars and not allowing old characters to completely take over The Force Awakens. Es expand your universe in other ways besides destroying everything the fans hold dear. In closing, I look forward to seeing Fantastic Beasts and where to find them and embracing the new characters and lore and knowing that I can rest easy and there's no way they can ruin those original seven books right. Enjoy the holiday movie season, J.K. Rowling. I love you, but Cursed Child, I, I just can't. And, and I know we're wow. three months out, but I, I just can't. Wow. I, I went there. I wasn't even J.K. Rowling. I haven't really read Harry Potter, but I, I felt slightly burned on that one. Sorry, Joe. <sighs> and thanks for watching The Waynesburg Effect. I hope that you enjoy your Christmas and uh, holiday season here. And from all of us here at The Waynesburg Effect, we hope you enjoy your time with your family and friends. And we'll see you in the new year in 2017 under President Donald J. Trump. Hard to believe that still. But thanks again for watching. Have a Merry Christmas. This has been a production of Waynesburg Community Television.